beautiful way to begin our time together at the body of Christ. Thank you, Sharon. We're glad you're feeling better and glad you're back with us. Only to not be with us next weekend. <laughs> but I'm, so, work, I'm working next There week. you go, but you're working this week, so that's great. Um, welcome, whether you are joining us online this morning, or maybe a spouse or a child has made you breakfast in bed and you're lounging in bed, but you got us tuned in and we're glad if that is the case, but we're glad that you are here with us um, in person as well. You notice um, announcements on the back of your bulletin. Uh, pay attention to those things that you need to. Um, look at the financial update for April. Thank you for your, uh, your good stewardship. Um, it takes all of us working together to make that happen. Um, today, of course, is Mother's Day, a day that is wonderful for some and a day that is hard for others. And so I ask you now to go with me to God in prayer on this day. This prayer comes from Pastor McGray de Vega over at um, High Park United Methodist Church in Tampa. Lord, on this day when we acknowledge the importance of motherhood, we first give thanks that you are a loving, loving parent to us all. From your being, all life was born, and in your bosom, all creation is nurtured. You have formed us in your image as your children and gathered us together as a brood under your wings. You have united us as kindred members of one human family, and we are grateful to be your offspring together. We celebrate your divine love that is reflected in human expression of motherhood. We give you thanks today for the mothers among us and ask that you strengthen them in their daily tasks. Grant them wisdom in the lessons they teach, patience in the discipline they foster, and persistence in their promotion of decency and compassion, both by word and example. May they be given the honor and thanks that they deserve, but oftentimes don't receive. We thank you also for all motherly figures, grandmothers, aunts, sisters, Wives, stepmothers, foster mothers, guardians, babysitters, teachers, healthcare providers, neighbors, and friends who practice self sacrifice and embody compassion to all who are privileged to be in their in their uh, their cloud of influence. Grant them vigor to carry on their work and satisfaction that the holy privilege of their task affords. We acknowledge to you, O oh God, that even amid our grateful celebration, many of us come with restless spirits this day, reluctant to name the difficulties that we go through. For some, this day brings a sorrowful awareness of their own ability to conceive biological children. Draw your tender spirit near their feelings of self-betrayal, impotence, and grief, and remind them that those who struggle with infertility have always shared a special place in your heart. We pray for those who have suffered miscarriages, those fatigued by fertility treatments, and those struggling through the process of adoption. May they remember that in your power and through your church, they can still leave a lasting legacy beyond themselves. For some, this day is marked by loneliness and grief as they spend this first Mother's Day as a widow or an orphan or a parent who has lost a child. To those who today live in the wake of the death of a loved one, grant glimpses of the resurrection. Bring to them a steady restoration of their broken hearts and allow them to live into their future with hope. And so empower them to carry out the legacy of lessons instilled within them. For some, Lord, this is a day that surfaces ongoing tensions that exist within personal relationships and family dynamics. We ask for healing from the wounds of our past, a path of forgiveness for wrongs, both experienced and committed, and the rebuilding of trust. We give you thanks for the wide spectrum of motherhood represented among us today, new mothers and young mothers, whose children are in their most tender years, mothers of grown children who transition into empty nesters and a new chapter of their lives, Mothers and grandmothers of advanced years whose twilight of life is marked by frailty of body, but a potency of spirit. Theirs is a cumulative reminder that through our lives, and though our lives are marked by transition and change, you never stop nurturing and loving us. 
Therefore, remind us to live with a childlike faith, curious to every wondrous mystery, attentive to your every instruction, obedient to your every command, and willing to share with everyone of your children. We give you thanks, O God, who is a loving mother and father to us all, and is whose name we most humbly pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. 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 Ward, is it you now? Yep. Ward has something to say. <laughs> Val, I want you to know that when I was preparing to make this announcement, I had to go and, to Amazon and try to choose what I wanted to wear today for this announcement. <laughs> and uh, you notice I have on a tie? Yes, I do. I see pink things on the tie. Ah, uh, yeah. Little <laughs> pink flamingos on there. <laughs> I, I actually looked at shirts that had big pink flamingos on it, but I didn't know if I could get from the home to the church and... If I stopped at Win dixie I, I didn't know if I'd want to go in or not. So. <laughs> so I chose the tie with the flamingos to be. Subtly. Yeah, but I still got, the, I still got the flamingos. Yes, you did. <laughs> uh, as all of you know, uh, Pastor Val is retiring. And uh, we have her roast, I mean her, uh, her, her retirement celebration. <laughs> Coming up on Saturday, June 15th, and it is going to be from 3 to 5 p.m. here in our fellowship hall. Uh, and we want to be sure that you all have it down, have it marked on your calendars, uh, and a plan to come. We do need you to RSVP about it so that we have enough uh, tally to know how many... Uh, of everybody to take care of on refreshments and things. And the date that's on the RSVP in the bulletin, and that was on this little handout that you got in the bulletin, says May 21. And actually, that shouldn't be that. That should be June the 1st instead. Uh, we don't need it by May 21, but we do need it by June 1st. And if you would RSVP to either Nancy... Uh, or if you can't get Nancy, uh, if you could just go to the church office and, and call and talk to Barb and tell Barb that you're going to be there and who else in your family is. Could they also write it on their pew pad? Uh, you their could. Sign -up sheets and other sign you can write office. it on your sign up sheet in in the uh, in the in yeah, that you have at your seats and just put it that way too. We're just wanting to have an accurate count there. And then when we get ready, we will have a flamingo bash instead of a, a monster bash uh, for Val. Or maybe it will monster. be a monster bash that is a flamingo bash. Uh, but it's going to be an interesting... One never knows. One never knows. <laughs> anyway, we, we want to send her off with a blessed and happy retirement. Thank you. For all of the many years of Thank service to us. that, I'll turn it over to the song master. And our praise hymn is 2272 in the Little Black Book. We are Black standing book. It, it in the Little Black Book. It didn't make the bulletin, but it's one of Georgie's favorites, so that's why we're singing. The stand is saying.
Thank you. You remain standing, please. Join with me in the call to worship. Easter people, raise your voices, for you belong to the risen Christ. We belong to Christ, and so we share in Christ together. Just as we share in Christ together, so we are called to share Christ with the world. We share Christ by proclaiming the good news of God's love to the world. How will you share God's love with the world? By loving, respecting, and honoring our neighbors, especially those the world neglects, overlooks, and ignores. Easter people, you belong to the risen Christ. We will share because we belong to Christ. We will share Christ's love and belonging everywhere we go. Amen. Five, six, nine. understand the word you have for us this day. Bless the reading of this word that it may speak to our hearts and then that we may carry out your word in the world. Amen.
if you would like to turn in your pew Bible or in uh, your personal Bible to Gospel According to John, we're in the 17th chapter, verses 6 through 19. One of my favorite films, and you, some of you may remember it or recognize it, is Dead Poets Society, starring Robin Williams as teacher John Keating. In a key scene in the movie, the school newspaper has released what the headmaster calls a profane and unauthorized article about a group of boys who meet each week in a cave to recite poetry about poets of the past. They call themselves, these boys do, the Dead Poets Society. This is an all-boys school named Welton, and it has the headmaster's name is, is headmaster Nolan, and he is hot on the trail to find these culprits, and he calls a school-wide assembly to fret out these evil perpetrators. While he is addressing the students, assuring them that he is going to find the guilty parties and string them up by their necks, a phone rings out in the middle of the audience, an old black traditional 50s type phone that the boys have made up in physics class and figured out how to get it to ring on its own. And Charlie, who is the organizer behind the poet group, stands up and says, Mr. Nolan, he's holding the phone in his hand, it's for you. It's God calling. He says there should be girls at Welton. Well, I won't even go into what Charlie's fate was after that. It wasn't good, assure me. <laughs> I assure you. But in today's scripture, God is calling again. But this time it is for real. Here, Jesus is teaching us about ways to communicate with God through prayer. You know, we don't have a lot of record of prayers from Jesus uh, in the te New Testament. We have the two versions of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew and Luke and the Garden of Gethsemane prayer and the prayer on the cross. But if we put everything together that Jesus did on the way of prayer, it would be a very small collection that we have. And that is why this John 17 prayer that is the scripture for today is so meaningful. It is sometimes referred to as the other Lord's Prayer or John's version of the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus begins by talking to the Father and is making petitions to him for those whom he is going to be leaving and for us also today. And in this prayer, Jesus is the mediator between God and humanity, making some very important points, giving is important in prayer. You know, giving is inward from God to Jesus, but it is also, I was just pointing this out when we were talking in the office, it's outward from us, from Jesus to us, and then from us to, to others. And as we do this, Jesus' own are to be protected to fulfill the mission that they've been given as disciples of his love. Prayer, of course, is to be sanctified in the truth. In other words, made holy. The Word is the glue between the Father and the Son, and through Jesus, the Word is made flesh. flesh. Amen. <laughs> Jesus' disciples have been called into this world to transform the world by proclaiming the good news through word and deed. Now, can you think about that for a second and then stop and think about John Wesley and the mission of the United Methodist Church? And I think you can see that that comes directly from Scripture. All disciples, of course, are called the original disciples, but more importantly, all of us. At the end of his life, Jesus is asserting to us here that he has completed the work of his father. Jesus did not really heal everyone that he came into contact with, and he did not travel extensively, 
only about a hundred miles from Nazareth. And he did not directly write any books, <clears throat> the entire New Testament, uh, notwithstanding. Uh, but he did have his priorities in order. He not only did things in the right way, but he also did the right things, like teaching us about prayer. Well, this reading today is about prayer, truth, and protection. God meets us where we are, he protects us, and he sends us to bring the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ to others. We share Christ as he was freely given to us by the Father, to the Son, to us. Join me in John 17, 6 through 19. I have revealed your name to the people you gave me in this world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. And now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. That is because I gave them the words that you gave me, and they received them. They truly understood that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you gave me, because they are yours. Everything that is mine is yours, and everything that is yours is mine. I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, even as I am coming to you. Holy Father, watch over them in your name, the name you gave me, that they will be one just as we are one. When I was with them, I watched over them in your name the name you gave to me, and I kept them safe. None of them were lost except for the one who was destined for destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Now I'm coming to you, and I say these things while I'm in the world so that they can share completely in my joy. I give your word to them, and the world hated them because they don't belong to this world, just as I don't belong to this world. I'm not asking that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them safe from the evil one. They don't belong to this world, just as I don't belong to this world. Make them holy in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. I made myself holy on their behalf so that they also would be made holy in the truth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, this weekend, many were in awe of an experience of a lifetime. Now, if you didn't witness it yourself, you saw maybe you saw many of the photos that were captured and posted on social media. The Aurora Borealis, or the Northern Lights once only seen in Iceland or other far places in the world, were visible in much of the U.S., even here in Florida, for two nights, all thanks to a severe solar storm. And all you could say, or all I could say anyhow, when I saw those pictures was, wow, how amazing is this? What an event. And people couldn't keep it to themselves. They had to share it. They had to tell it. They had to show others. And isn't that just one of the messages that Jesus is giving to his disciples in today's text? Wow. Share it. Show it. Share it. Have you ever 
kind of wandered in on a conversation accidentally. <laughs> You've overheard a conversation going on and, and all of a sudden you found yourself so wrapped up in it that you couldn't tear yourself away. Maybe it was a couple who was arguing in the grocery store. Or maybe it was while you were at the pharmacy and you saw a man helping his elderly mother with her prescriptions. Or maybe it was just two kids playing make-believe in the neighborhood and you just had to listen closely. There's something about an overheard conversation that gives you a glimpse into their, the people's relationship and their life together as you observe how they interact with one another. Well, that's kind of how I felt as I was reading today's passage, even as disjointed as it seemed to be at times. You remember it's a time of the Last Supper. Jesus has already washed his disciples' feet. A final meal has been shared. He's told them that he's leaving, as he has been doing for time after time. The end is near. Judas leaves the table and went out and goes out into the night with his 30 pieces of silver. According to John, Jesus is troubled in spirit. He knows that his friends will abandon him. He knows that Peter will deny him three times and that Thomas is going to doubt until he sees proof. And Jesus feels the hate of the world. No wonder his prayer is so rambling and confusing, repetitious and hard to understand. I suspect that's because of what's going on in Jesus' mind. It's got to be random and, and just a little bit disjointed. And whereas you may think that he's talking to the disciple, he's, at first he's not. And he's not even talking to us when this prayer begins. He's not teaching and he's not giving instruction. He's praying to his Father. And we are privileged enough to listen in. Jesus reflects on his life, his life that has been lived in community with the Trinity. And he prays that this life, this unity that he shares with the Father and the Spirit might be the same relationship that we have as well. Wow. It's one thing when you know somebody is praying for you, because believe me, as a preacher, you cannot stand in a pulpit unless you've got people praying for you. Keith, you would agree with that wholeheartedly, wouldn't you? But wow, to think that Jesus is praying for you and for me. Remember, he's given them a new commandment to love one another in the same way that he has loved them. He says, you're going to be able to do that because... When you abide and stay connected to me, it'll all work. And then he goes on to say, it's all about love. I want you to bear much fruit. I want you to love each other the same way that I have loved you. And now before his betrayal, his arrest and crucifixion, he takes time out to pray. You'll notice that he starts by praying for himself and then for the disciples and then for those who will come to believe based on the words that the disciples will share with others. He prays for people like you and me, for the future generations to come and for those who know, do not yet believe. Mary Hinkle Shore, a professor at Luther Seminary, comments on today's scripture. She says, in this text, we hear a prayer on our behalf and at first are not called into action in that moment as much as called to awe and wonder that the Father and the Son would spend their time discussing the likes of you and me and our little community of faith. In other words, Jesus' prayer is not only a call to action, but an invitation to wonder, much like what has happened with the Northern Lights this weekend. They experienced awe and wonder. And what did they do with that? They shared it. Jesus prays for both those who know him now, like the disciples and those who will come to know him and believe him through the testimony and the witness of the disciples. 
So knowing God starts first in a community of faith. We come to know God through the witness of the disciples, through people like Mary Magdalene, Thomas, and Peter, those first witnesses to the resurrection. Their witness continues then in the stories of the apostles like Paul and Silas, who pray and sing hymns in jail while the other prisoners and even the guards listen in. We come to know God through the witness of everyday saints. People like your neighbor who has taken up gardening after her husband died and now shares her rhubarb and peonies with you. Or the school crossing guard who protects your children as they're on their way to school. Or maybe you have one of those friends who's not afraid to be candid even though the truth might sting. Saints like family members, like mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles and grandparents, aunts and, and people here in these pews. The saints help us to know God in our ordinary lives. And then we, become, we come to know God through our own first-hand experiences in this time and this place. Do you realize that in worship, our liturgy helped us to know God and to give witness to God through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ? They point to a God who is always with us in the singing of the hymns and in the silence of prayer in the sprinkling of water, of the waters of baptism, and in the breaking of the bread and the giving of the wine at communion, in our confessions of faith and our abounding doubt, in our gathering together as community. You see, once we come to know God ourselves and recognize that knowing God is an ongoing relationship or what you might call a process of becoming, we share and make God known to others. We witness to what we know. We can't keep it to ourselves. We must share it. Like Mary, we tell our friends, I've seen the Lord. Like Lydia, we invite others into our homes, her fellowship, and bringing the cloth and making things creatively. Like the jailer, we provide healing. And with those who have gone before us, and those who will come after us, we unite ourselves in a common witness to God so that we may become one in him. United in a shared witness, we grow into community together. We grow in our ability to stand together despite that which could divide us. And I believe, my friends, that that's what happened. <laughs> and what was seen at this year's general conference in Charlotte. Despite differences that could divide, everything I have heard, everything I have read, talks about the kindness, the respect for one another, whether you agree with them or not, the coming together for a common cause. We deepen our love for God and our love for others and as we hear this prayer today, we participate in God's life and in the lives of one another as we discover the wonder and awe of it all. And one thing I noticed when I was reading it today was the sense of urgency in Jesus' voice as he pours out his heart for those who are closest to him. He speaks out of love and passion for his God and for his disciples. And yes, it's a complex prayer, there are reflections on life. There are things he wants us to remember. There are important last words. A call to spiritual struggle and commitment, and most of all, a call to share his heart. Think about it for a minute. Every one of us is here today. We are followers of Christ because someone at some time in our life shared Christ with us. Maybe you can even think of who that is right now and give thanks for that person. Could have been a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, could have been a bus driver, could have been a friend or a neighbor. Maybe they told us or read to us a Bible story or they shared what a difference Jesus had made in their own lives. 
Maybe they picked you up and took you to Sunday school or Bible school or youth group. Or maybe they invited you to a Christian concert or to come to church with them. And friends, that didn't just happen. It happened because Jesus prayed for us. He prayed for protection and unity that we may be sanctified or set free from sin. Now, this doesn't guarantee an easy life like you've seen some of those, uh, excuse me, TV pastors, you know, say, oh, give it all to God and you're going to have the fanciest car and the biggest house and you are just going to want for nothing. No, our relationship with Christ is you're not guaranteed a life without pain or suffering, but you're guaranteed that Jesus will walk with you every step of the way. It doesn't remove us from illness or disappointment, from brokenness or loss. It doesn't even remove us from this world and all of its challenges. But it does mean that there is one who loves you with an everlasting love. There is one who prays for you. Isn't that amazing? Now, coming here on Sundays is important for many reasons. But I would say today it's vital to the expression and understanding of our faith. And it's also risky to come here. Because you might hear Jesus speaking to you. And you might hear that like the disciples, you're being called out of those comfy pews to get out into a world that needs to know Jesus. And friends, if you're like me, so many times we, we have this closed vision and think, Oh, I don't know anybody who doesn't know Jesus. Everybody I know loves Jesus and knows him. Everybody I know goes to church. You would be amazed. And maybe if you've experienced that, not everybody has heard of him. I can even remember when I was working as director of youth over in Auburndale, that one time one of the youth who actually came from a family whose his grandfather was a preacher, actually said to me, because I had asked if I could pray for him about something, and he said, nobody's ever asked if they could pray for me before. I was taken aback. But you know, our eyes have to be open to that. Maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's somebody you work with. There are people out there who don't know Christ. And so Jesus speaks to us. He says, I'm counting on you to do just like I told my disciples to do. Go. Go into the world and share Christ with them. Proclaim the good news to the poor. Heal the sick. Free the oppressed. This, my friends, is love. We've been talking that, about that for the last three weeks, haven't we? We talked about how we need to, to start talking about it. We talked about the vine and the branches and the fruit. We said, you can't bear fruit if you're not connected to the vine. If we're not connected with Christ, how on earth can we love others? And then we said, you've got to love others in the way that Christ loved us. And now the final command today is that we are to pass on that good news that we know. We must share Christ with others. Sometimes it's with words, other times with actions. As Easter people, we are encouraged not to dwell in this, this probably sadness and the sense of abandonment that the first disciples felt knowing Jesus was going away. But we should live with the hope the assurance that we have that Jesus will continue to be with us now that the work for which he had been sent to do has been accomplished. Jesus prays for us in the same way that our parents do. A way that a parent, loving parent prays for their child. He is praying for us out of love. And this whole section of John's gospel lays it out for us. He knows what's ahead. He knows what the disciples need to be reminded of. And he knew that the only way his mission would continue would be if the disciples continued to do the work he had begun. And he says, 
in not so many words, I'm counting on you. That he knew that the world out there would be difficult. He knew that not all that they wanted to go share the gospel with would receive it. He knew that some of them would be persecuted for their faith. He knew that some of them would be ridiculed and laughed at. And that is why in his prayer you hear him talking about protection. We have a hedge of protection around us because that is what Jesus prays for us. He begs his father to give them all the help and the support that he could provide. And isn't it kind of a wake-up call for us? A reality check when we realize that sharing Christ in the world is not easy? You know, I saw that in China, especially. Um, underground churches. People going out at night to learn how to be pastors, to reach others so they could share Jesus with them. People who were so bound by the government that they could only have two children, that only if you were under, nobody under 18 could come to church. And heaven forbid that you preached evangelism in the church. Pastors all had to have their sermons pre-approved by the government. You know, we might be rejected. We might be made fun of. It makes us vulnerable. And it makes us uncomfortable. Jesus knew what we would be facing. And so he prayed for the things we needed. The truth is that we need all the prayer we can get as followers of Christ so that we can continue to love and share Christ with others. And what's the end result? He prays that they will glorify God with their lives through the love and unity that they show in this world. When, we, when, we, when they and we do so, it will cause others to ask questions, maybe to marvel in awe and wonder, and guess what? The good news is that post-Pentecost, which is next week, by the way, everything Jesus expresses here about his followers would come true. But at this particular moment, it was a final act of love that he prayed the way he did. Because when you love people, when you love your children, you want the best for them. And you express it in your prayers for them. You and I have been sent into the world in the same way that Jesus was. Not to save the world, but to introduce Christ to them. And you can't do that sitting in your comfortable pew. Because when you're sent, what do you do? You go. You go to remind the world of God's reckless and sacrificial love for them. This, my friends, is the way we should love. Abide in Christ. Bear fruit by loving others the way Christ loved you and share Christ with others. And when necessary, use words. Amen? amen. And amen. Well, our United Methodist women are really good at sharing Christ with others. And Nancy, you want to call some of your ladies up here to yes. help? We're going to have a blessing of these adorable baby dolls you see up here. If you get a, get a, a chance to see them up close and personal, you'll be amazed. I'm going to put one here. Okay. Do you want to? praying for somebody who's up here, um, just as an act of unity and praying for, if you've raised your hand towards, um, our <laughs> they're cuter that way, we show them their faces, so if you put your hand towards these babies and these officers as we join in prayer. Loving God, we ask your blessings upon these dolls that speak of the diversity of our world. 
May these dolls bring a smile to the child who receives it, for they are given in love. We are thankful for the connection between the United Methodist Women of Faith and their care, concern, and commitment to Cornerstone Ministries in Tampa, where their mission is to make a lasting and a positive impact in the lives of economically disadvantaged children and their families in our community. Cornerstone does this by nourishing young bodies, developing young minds, and fostering hope through Christ, one child at a time. And so today, even though we don't know, name, don't know names, we pray for these children who will receive these dolls, and we pray for those who work with them. May we share Christ with them through this gift. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Women of Faith, Nancy, and, and officers, thank you so, so much.
news. And um, Marilyn, we're not sure because sometimes she can't hear the phone and she doesn't answer the phone. But uh, she was dealing with pneumonia. Our prayer is that she's not in the hospital and continues uh, continue prayer for all these women though. And, um, and those who may be traveling as well. Rena has begun her, um, her, her chemotherapy treatment. Um, the countermans, uh, Jean is sick right now as, and Ron has had more fluid drained. Um, the Harrisons didn't, were not able to leave when they expected. They'll be flying back up to Indiana though. And um, you notice those on our list that you will want to remember in your prayers. Um, I have to thank Glenda, who took the Zoe ministry prayer to heart. And I think you have already written to the heads of all the households, 25 households, right? Pardon? 50 heads of households. Okay. Amazing. So um, if you haven't gotten that list, it was in your bulletin a couple weeks ago, or if you want one, we'll have some extra copies back there. This is just a way to encourage them in what all they are doing, how they are looking after their siblings, how they are um, just becoming entrepreneurs you know, trying to figure out what's the best way, the cheapest way I can get eggs. So in turn, I can bring them back to Rwanda and sell them again. Um, there will also be things for sale that we can purchase. Uh, or we can we can have them purchase when they go on the trip to Zoe this summer. So anyhow, just continue to remember that important ministry. Um, Just, okay, I just lost a thought. Okay. <coughs> I saw a wonderful clip of a, a young theater bud actor among us. Gabe um, was in a recent play. Yeah, Gabe's waving to everybody, just so you know where he is. Gabe was in a uh, The Lion King put on by the Out of the Box Players um, in Lakeland. As you may, may remember, um, Joanne Woods was in some of those plays when, when the Woods family were here with us. So Gabe, we're proud of you. Keep up the great work. You're welcome. <laughs> and um, let us turn now. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, what you got? I have a joy. Too. The joys are good. All right, her spine doctor is happy with the progress and the healing, and we thank God for that, yes. Let us now turn to God in prayer. God of all creation, who called every being into life, who is mindful of humankind in all its diversity, who embodies us with dignity, granting different gifts and talents to shape life in this world. We ask for your spirit to unite us where we lack, face lack of understanding and disunity in our churches, in our communities, and in our countries. And in silence, we lay before you the burdens of our hearts. We ask for your spirit to unite us in the face of the conflicts hatred and violation of life experienced in so many regions of our earth. And in silence, we bring to you the pain of those innocent victims. We ask for your spirit to unite us wherever fear prevents us from caring for our neighbor, from meeting people of different ethnicities, cultures, and faith communities with respect. And in silence, we bring to you the brokenness of human relationships. God of all creation, in Christ we are reconciled, and so we ask for your united spirit to help us overcome all our divisions that we may live in peace together. We pray these things in the name of the one who taught his disciples to pray like this. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before our last hymn, Mommy, I told you I would update after the video that um, Bishop Berlin and, and Molly McIntyre, Alex Shanks, and McGray um, uh, gave last week on Tuesday. Some of you may have watched it. I hope you did. I encourage you to watch it. It was kind of an overview of the general conference as a whole, and then they spoke of some specifics. And I'm not going to give you a whole lot of information, but I'm going to give you some. First, I know some of you like to, to read and you're looking for a new devotional. There's a new Methodist book of daily prayer that is coming out. And so look that up, and, and um, that might be something that you would want to have with you. Um, Bishop Berlin said, you know, he says, I've been to conferences, general conferences, annual conferences. He says, I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> Talked about the last day of worship, um, which is usually, you know, kind of downtime and, you know, people are leaving early. He said, the band, for some reason, started playing that old song, Love Train. Know that song, some of you? Yeah. And all of a sudden, these little conga lines started going throughout the conference. And he said, you know, he said this wouldn't have happened if there wasn't that respect, not animosity, even when people didn't agree. Those same people got in a conga line together. They still celebrated the love train. He said it wouldn't have happened if people weren't, as I said before, respectful, kind, he saw the power of caring for one another despite their differences. Um, some of the things that, that you may have been wondering, it, it may seem like, oh, they're pushing all of this on us, you know? And that is not the case. Everything, the power lies in the congregation and the pastor, okay? In, Yes, they removed the restrictive language that banned uh, homosexuals from licensing or ordination. Um, and they took away the language that says you cannot perform same-sex weddings. But the clergy and congregations have the right to decide what is best in their context. Does that make sense to you? Okay. For example... You have a system here, okay? You've got the general conference, then annual conference, and then the district, et cetera, et cetera. And the local church has the staff parish relations team, for example. Let's say, okay, I'm just making all this up. So let's say that there is a couple who wants me to marry them that was in my youth group. You know, one of them was in my youth group years ago. And they say, oh, since this is half... Past, Pastor Val, will you marry us in the church? So, the first thing, the pastor asks themselves, is this something that I feel comfortable doing or not? And just like pastors have had the ability already to say, I don't believe this couple is ready to be married, whether they are same sex or just a man and a woman. We have always had that right. So that right is with us now to say, you know, it's not because you're of this persuasion, or maybe it is, but I don't feel that that's something I can do. And that's okay. Also, let's say, let's just say I wanted to do that. I would go to probably the administrative council law and now what we talked about going to the administrative council, the church council, and say, I have been approached. They would like me to marry them. They'd like me to marry them in the church. What is your pleasure? Okay? 
the church has the ability to say, okay, I, 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 you know, I understand your feeling that you would want to do this for them, but we don't feel right having it done in a church. Could you do it in another location? So do you see what I'm saying? The clergy and the local church still have a say. Does that clear some things up for you? I hope it does. Read. I mean, I've got in the back today, uh, there'll be people at the doors. Frequently asked questions. Take that home, read it. If you still got questions, come talk to me. You know, we, how many families agree on everything? Okay. <laughs> No family agrees on everything. Guess what? Our United Methodist family doesn't agree on anything, but we can respect, be kind to, and love one another in the middle of our diversity. Amen. So, I pray that that helps. I pray that you will continue to have an open mind, and if you don't understand something, if you have a question about something, come to me. But don't make some rash judgments that are not kind or loving. Um, help us to be more like Christ. I think that's one thing that this general conference has taught us. To be more like Christ. We've sung that hymn before. More like Christ Jesus. More like you. And that's what we are to do. Okay. Ready to say? We're ready to sing Pass It On, a good old camp song, but it's exactly what Jesus told us in that prayer.